I'd like to call the uh, regular meeting of the Nashville uh, Town Council to order at this time. Could we please stand for our, our pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. Father, again, we invite you to this council meeting to lead us, guide us, and give us your wisdom and to help us make the decisions that will benefit everybody in Nashville. Amen. Amen. We have, uh, we are um, on remote tonight with Lynn Hobbs, so we're going to have to do things differently. So I'm going to have to take a roll call at this time, so I will um, ask you um, to give your name and say present. So we'll start in alphabetical order with uh, Kate. Kate Burns, present. Louise. Louise Hinton, present. Um, Lynn. Lynn Hobbs, present. And Larry. Larry Taylor, present. Thank you very much. So we're all here one way or the other. All right, on our, let's start with our agenda. First of all, it's approving, and tonight we're going to have to take a vote by member. You'll have to give your name and your vote on everything that we vote on because we are remote, and that's legally what we have to do. So let's look at our minutes from May 18th, 2021. Are there any corrections to those minutes? If not, do I hear a motion that we approve the minutes for uh, May 18th, the budget work session? So moved. Give your name and. Louise Hinton, so moved. Is there yep. a second? Larry Taylor, second. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Kate Burns, aye. aye. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now let's look at May 25th, uh, budget work session two minutes. Are there any corrections to those? If not, do I hear a motion that we approve those? Larry Taylor being none, I vote we approve. It, Louise Hinton, second. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Lu, um, Kate Burns, aye. And Lynn? Lynn Hobbs, aye. Thank you very much. Now we'll move on uh, down to our... Um, Mayor Street, I have one question. I mean... <laughs> Mayor Street, <laughs> I have <didn't laughs> <say. laughs> Mayor Brown, I have one question. Okay. Um, when will we get the June um, minutes? Are those? Uh, they're about halfway done. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, at this time, we'll go to item uh, number three on our agenda, and I will turn it over to um, Sherry Moss. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Mayor, did you? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Please, go ahead. <laughs> the item that I have on the agenda tonight is for Downtown Strong Advisory Board to approve reappointment for Susan Phelps. And this is for a two-year appointment for the Downtown Nashville Strong Advisory Board. She's been a very active member of the Downtown Nashville Strong Advisory Board this last year, chairing several committees and renewing interest in downtown incentive programs. Her term on the advisory board expired June 30th, 2021, and she has expressed interest in being reappointed to a two-year term on the advisory board to June 30th, 2023. Susan, stand up so everyone can see you. She has served us well. <laughs> Do I hear um, a motion that um, we um, keep Susan Phelps on our um, downtown Nashville Strong Advisory Board? Larry Taylor moved to approve. Second. <laughs> Name. Kate Burns. Um, all those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Ops, aye. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to introduce someone else tonight before we get into our meeting. Taylor Joyner. Where are you, Taylor? He has come to work with us from Rocky Mount, and he's taken Thurman Evans' place in our department, and we're so glad that you're with us. Thank you so very much. And we've already gotten him busy fixing broken pipes and leaks and everything. But um, he came with a very good recommendation. We're glad you chose to work with us. At this time, we will um, go to our public comments. 
and I will call your names. You have three minutes. State your name and address as you come forward. James Baker. My name is James Baker. I live at 103 East Green <coughs> Street. I really have two topics, so I'm going to try to make it quick because I know I'm limited on my time. But the first topic is, is on the 4th of July. I don't know if everybody was aware of what happened on the 4th of July, but it sounded like we had a revolutionary war going on over there at my house. And it was so bad that the windows were shaking in my house. And it went on, it was going on near 10 o'clock, and I had to finally had to call the police department because I looked outside and these fireworks were protruding completely way up in the air and they were going all over those silos right behind my house at Braswell. And we also got that Glasgow company there that's got flammable material paints and stuff. Do we want to have fireworks going all over? That, that was an explosion ready to happen. And you know, you got them railroad cars that's also on that railroad track. That could have really been a real bad situation. And it took me to call the police department to come out there. It took them five minutes and it was shut down. And then, you know, the year before, on the 4th of July, you know, we were in a pandemic. And like I said, I'm not, I don't have no problem for anybody having a good time or no, but you know, when it starts getting to be 11 o'clock at night, that mess needs to be shut down. Because some people have to work overnight and trying to sleep, but I'm, you know, you can expect some kind of fireworks going off, you know, but these were like cannons. I mean, it was, this was something that you would go see a city show. And it went on for the longest time. And now the other topic I want to talk about is the water. I got my water bill. My water bill was more than my electric bill. My water bill was $230. Ooh. I went up to the town hall, and I'm not going to mention no names because I'm not like that. I spoke to two individuals. And I said, what's going on here? The young lady pulled up my record. Y'all usually use two to 3,000 gallons of water a month. I used 10,000 gallons of water. Now, I had a problem last year, and of course, I had a low reading, and I was told at that time is that my meter didn't read, and I had a double charge. Well, I'm just telling you, 10,000 gallons of water, I, I wasn't even home for two weeks. I was away. So I don't know, and so I was told, the young lady, and I'm not going to say who else was there, told me that they were going to go out and investigate it, and I would be notified the next day for me not to pay my water bill. A week later, I've not been contacted yet to what has been resolved about it. And I think, you know, I, I brought it up before where I talked about we needed to have communication, transparency, but the most important thing that we, and I don't think it's too much for us to ask, is follow up. I think that I'm asking all of you four, what do you think about, should we at least be in contact and at least just be a time and manner of 48 hours? If you can't do anything, at least let us know something. You know, just don't let it go out one ear and out the other. That's all I'm asking. But I mean, it's just, just my, and then another thing, and I did, you know, I just talked to Mr. Manson about, he said he's willing to help us work out on this situation. I'm a yard person. I love my yard more than anything. I think Miss Kate knows. Mm -hmm. And, um, if it, it might have been something to do with my water in my yard, I don't know. But why is it that I cannot dig a well? Now, the well water would not be going into the sewer system. Time. I'm sorry. Thank you so very much, James. Bosch Hand. Thank you, Madam Mayor and the board. Um, I'm just going to say this about the... Give us your address, please. Oh, I'm sorry. That's fine. 100 East Green Street. Thank you. Um, this is my thought about the water. It was said from one of the board members that it's been seven years since we'd had a water increase. I get it. But what it seems you have done is put seven years of an increase right there this month. And I feel like it should have been done like in increments of, of maybe three years and bring it back up. And it seems like, and I may be just fishing, but it just seems like because of a problem that we had with the Rocky Mount problem and things that combined into that, that we're trying to like shore up our, our business. 
you, you follow that, you shore up our water. But that's, uh, my water bill was $190. That's a lot, that's a lot of money. And I can pay it, but I wanna know who else can pay something like that. And look, last time I looked, Bill Gates didn't live in our neighborhood. We don't have that kind of structure in this town to go for this high amount of water. I'm just asking you, please look at it, bring it down and see, see what we can do and then go up. You know, that was a big jolt. I appreciate it. Thank you. Brian Hester. I'm Brian Hester, 109 East Washington Street. Um, I'm here to talk about the trees. Uh, one second. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you guys, your council and officials for all your hard work. Um, I know it's not easy, and thank you. Um, from the beginning, the process of the tree inspection, the trees should have been solicited to multiple certified arborists for inspection. I understand the inspections are not free um, they cost money. Um, some might not call you back. Some might not even respond at all. Um, but how does one make an informed decision with one report? You can't, so you get the second report. Um, unfortunately, these two reports, they conflict with each other. Now, they're, now who do, what report do you guys follow? So now you gotta get a third or fourth assessment so, uh, to take place. So it just keeps pushing further down the road here. And you know, people's safety and their lives, their safety and property are at risk. One of these trees in front of my property, which was tagged as part of the inspection, recently dropped a six inch by eight foot long branch. And this was a clear sunny day, no rain, no rain. Um, this hasn't happened, this isn't the first time. And you know, I'm thankful that my kids were not outside at the time playing or um, someone else walking by. You know, this could have severely hurt them or even killed somebody. Um, so it's my hope that with the, with the decision being made that, it's, that an informed decision is gathered with all the information citizens, with the citizen safety in mind and not the aesthetics, the property value or budgetary limitations. Trees can be replaced, property values can be regained, budgetary concerns can be amended. A person's life cannot be replaced. So, Thank you. Thanks. Leona Hetchbath. My name is Lavanya Hedgepath, and I'm here to uh, speak on the water in Give behalf. us your address, please, Leah. 326 North Aviation Avenue, apartment 28A. Thank you. Um, yes, the water has made a jump uh, for the last uh, two months. It's, it's made a jump for $10 to $11 and some change every month. And you've got senior citizens, people on disability, and they want a fixed income. And not only that, other people, everybody's concerned about uh, this water because it, it really is not making no sense. And the only answer you can get uptown is, and I asked the lady, why is it going up so high? And she says, well, it's because of the sewer and all of that. I'm going like making a $10 jump and all this kind of stuff. And it really needs to be looked into because it's making a jump from the last, from June, it made a $10 jump. <laughs> July, it made an $11 jump. And it should really be looked into because it makes no sense. And she's going to sit there and tell me, yes, a thousand gallons of water, that's even though you don't use it, it's, 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 that, it's that price. And it really needs to be looked into and something done about it. It really does. Thank you so much. Thank you. Larry Hyde. Uh, 
113 Meredith Woods, uh, Meredith Woods Court. I guess you can give it, okay. Um, I want to just mention some briefly, a couple of things. Parking. Um, I was here, well, it was actually 50 years ago this month. That's when I came downtown. And the biggest problem we had back then in 1971 was parking. Well, it's still a problem. Uh, I don't know where it's as big a problem uh, now as it was then or not. I would make a suggestion to correct it. It might save a lot of money, but it'd have to, you'd, uh, I think that the biggest part of the parking problem are these judges and lawyers that come over for court and uh, park wherever they want as long as they want. And I think that uh, I think you should be a fine of one hour of parking. This is just a suggestion. One hour of parking and then put a fine on it that'll shake, make them shaking the boots and have somebody out there to take care of it. Uh, I don't when the last time I saw somebody walking, a policeman walking up and down Main Street. I don't guess they do that anymore. I ain't seen anybody anyway. And, uh, but that's just, that's just one thing. Another thing is uh, someone said uh, they looked at the water bill and only got, going up $10. You might consider yourself lucky because uh, it's going to be, it's going to probably be going up higher than that. And uh, uh, mine didn't go up to 30 and I was tickled to death. And because uh, it'll probably go up again, but I mean, that's, that's trying to recoup, recoup costs and all that. And it's not over with. Uh, I can see the water going up another 30, 40, 50 dollars a month. Uh, that's what I'm expecting. May not, hope I'm wrong. But before we grab hold of another piece of debt, such as, uh, such as this Nashville Junction and stuff like that, I think we should be doggone sure that we've got the water and sewer under control before we grab hold of guaranteeing that debt. You know, do we may find ourselves really in a big mess because the town without water and sewer I mean, that's, that is not good. Parking's one, parking's bad enough, but if you don't have water and sewer, you may not have a town. And this has got to be, I, you know, it's, uh, I don't know what, I don't know where this, I don't think this latest price increase is gonna take care of it. I hope I'm wrong, but I, I wouldn't be afraid to bet whatever anybody wants to bet, this won't be the last price increase. So uh, that's just two or three thoughts. Uh, Let's get, get, get a hold of the expenses on the water and sewer before you grab any more debt. Thanks for your comments. Emma Joyner. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I live at 326 Brookway Village, apartment 9A, and my concern is the water. My water bill went sky high, which to some people it might not be sky high, but to me, I live on a short income, low income, and it has really, I've had to do, do without some of my medication this month just to come pay this, and I, I cannot afford it. I cannot, I mean, it's jumped up for the last two months, and, and if it's going to keep going up, I don't want to do it. I really don't, and I appreciate that there's something that can be done about it, because, I mean, it's, it's 53.35, and to a lot of people, that wouldn't be nothing, but to me, it's a lot, and if y'all can look into it, I would definitely appreciate it, because it is bothering some of my other bills that I cannot afford. Thank you, Ms. Joyner. We appreciate you sharing with us. Thank you. Now we will move on to our um, public hearings for tonight. Um, I need a motion to open uh, the public hearing for the street and special events permit. Uh, uh, somebody raise their hand. Uh
Yeah, we were telling people which ones they needed to sign in. Uh, let's see. Doretha, you signed up the one for the inducement agreement at the National Junction. Did you mean to sign up for the... Well, come on up. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Doretha. Do I hear a motion that we? Um, this is for the. Let me find my spot. This is for the uh, street and special events permit. Do I hear a motion for uh, us to open the public hearing for that? Louise Hinton makes a motion that we open the public hearing. Senator Taylor, second. Capern's aye. All oh, those. Oh, aye. 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 Lynn. Aye. And um, aye. Hops, aye. Okay, thanks. <laughs> and we do not have anyone signed up to speak um, about that. Should I just read the? Re I'm going to read what we have that uh, Corey left with me. It says the town of Nashville Parks Recreation and Cultural Resources. Department has submitted a street and special events permit application for a music in the park event co-sponsored by Market Leader Realty. The event will be held on October the 8th, 2021 at the Stony Creek Environmental Park with a rain date of October the 9th, 2021. During the event, the department will offer lawn, ga lawn games and food trucks will be on site to offer food for purchase. The event will also feature a brewing beverage company to sell food and beverages. Since this will be hosted on town property and alcohol will be sold, a street and special events permit is required. No streets will be closed during the event. Parking will be available in the park's designated parking lot and will also be allowed along the assets road leading into the park. Overflow parking will be directed towards Evans Drive and West Nashville Drive. At this time, we are expecting 200 to 300 people to attend the event. The Technical Review Committee has no comment on the application and a public hearing was advised for um, October, the, um, advertised on July the 1st and July the 8th. So since we do not have any uh, one to speak in that, we, um, Can I speak to that? You, you did not sign up. <laughs> <laughs> But um, that'll be fine. Three minutes. Beth Matthews, 601 Santa, Bar Santa Bell Court, Nashville. So why is it okay now to host an event at that particular location in October when now in where the Nashville Junction is going, you want to build an amphitheater, and the reason you're doing it is because you're saying that after you've received a grant that you couldn't hold live music and all that kind of stuff out there at the Stony Creek location. So why do we need another amphitheater location? Does that make sense? So if you can hold music down at Stony Creek in October, then you can keep holding it there. Thank you. Um, because this is um, a remote meeting, we have to, the council cannot make any decision. It has to have a 24 longer public um, comment period. So due to this, we're gonna vote on this at our August 3rd meeting. But I need to have a motion and a vote on that. So do I hear a motion that we vote on this, um, the, um, park music and the the permits that we have to have on the August 3rd meeting. I have a question. Yes. Is the town co-sponsoring this event? Yes. All right. I make the motion that we vote on this at our next meeting. Louise Hinton. Kate Byrne, <laughs> second. Larry, is all those in favor say aye. Larry Taylor, aye. Lynn. Lynn Hobbs, aye. Thank you so very much. Now we, uh, do I hear a motion that we um, come out of public hearing for this topic? Is that correct, Clark, that we have to, okay. Kate Burns, so moved. Louise Hinton, second. Mary Taylor, aye. <laughs> Lynn. Lynn Hobbs, aye. 
Thank you very much. Now we're going to move on to the next, the inducement agreement for the Nashville Junction. And I need to hear a motion that we, um, we open the public hearing for that. Kate Burns, so moved. We second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Lynn Hobbs, aye. Thank you very much. So at this time, we'll start the uh, public hearing. Barbara Shane. Mayor, would you mind? I, I could just summarize quickly for everybody. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry, Bob. We'll get you back up in just yeah. a minute. Okay. Thank you. So this is a public hearing on an inducement agreement between the town of Nashville and Hurt LLC, or Michael Hurt. So what is proposed at this point is, in this agreement, is that the town would appropriate already has appropriated and expend $275,000 of town funds to construct an approximate 125 space parking lot, a performing arts pavilion, and a green space audience area on the land owned by LLC, uh, Hurt LLC and leased to the town for $1 a year for 99 years. And this is on the old uh, Nashville building supply property that's on the east side of Barn Street. So the public parking lot and the performing arts stage and the green space will be constructed uh, according to the agreement by July 30th of 2022. The performing arts stage will be constructed by July 30th of 2023. The town will also lease the farmer's market venue from Hurt LLC under a two year lease at $1,500 a month and operate a farmer's market and other activities at that venue at the Nashville Junction. The public benefit to be derived from the proposed appropriation and expenditure is to increase property tax, sales tax revenues to the town of Nashville, to create new jobs for citizens of the town of Nashville, and to generally stimulate the local economy while promoting business prospects for the town of, in the town of Nashville. A hurt LLC uh, will expend $1.2 million to rehabilitate the existing 20,000 square foot building, the old former building in the Nashville Building Supply at 723 uh, South Barn Street into 12 retail suites by July 30th of 2022 and lease them to commercial and retail businesses to provide goods and services to Nashville residents and consumers. Hurt will also upfit two other buildings on the property into a farmer's market venue and lease them Lynn, to are you the still town. with us? Yes. Okay, thank you. So that is a summary of the inducement agreement. Okay, yeah. thank you, Barbara. Barbara Shand at 100 East Green Street. Um, I just have a few things. I read the newspaper that talked about the uh, farmer's market and everything and found <laughs> there was a grant, but that grant, if we get it, only pays 80%. And then we're left with the other part that we have to pay. And if we don't get the grant, the $250,000, the town has to pay. And this is where my issue is, because we're not buying the property, we're renting it. And 1500 a month for two years, if all goes well, that's great. But you also put a clause in there that if the first year it doesn't meet, it doesn't go in the black, then this is approximate $48,000. The second year you built in a little safety system for $59,000. You're not, it'll show you're in the black, but really you're covering it. You, out of all that money, y'all are covering it. It's not being paid for by anything, so it's losing money. And um, I just don't think that's a smart business deal, especially building a parking lot if we're just renting. I have never, and I, I've got a lot of family in business, and I just never heard of, I'll give you a parking lot if you, you know, build the rest, they will come. I just don't understand that. And uh, I just think that's losing money. And especially when we've got all that set aside, if it doesn't meet the standards 
and it's in the red, and we're going, oh, okay, we're just going to pay it off for the first two years. No, if it's not meeting in the red, you close it down. And it may work. I'm not saying it won't. It may work, but I don't think the city should be responsible for the parking lot. I think that Mr. Hurt, who's given $102 million, he's got an investment in that too. And by darn, he should pay for that parking lot. That's his property, his businesses. All we're doing is renting a farmer's marketplace, and then we're going to rent the rest of it for a dollar a year for 99 years. I, I just looked at it and looked at the money, and it just doesn't add up unless we're buying it. Thank you. Thank you. Christopher Sandy. Hey, I'm Christopher Sandy. I own the property at 720 South Body Street con connected to the proposed junction. And, um, you know, one side of the fence, I'm all in support of it because, I mean, that part of town, especially that building, needs some, some great repair. The, and, and anything that happens down there in a positive manner, I think is great. But <laughs> there's got to be a line, and my stance on this is we shouldn't mix public funds with private enterprise. Yeah. If you do this, then you open up Pandora's box. Or if you do it for one, you need to do it for others. And I can say with the investment, I don't have millions of dollars in the building I own is 15,000 square feet. And every single thing that's done there and every dime that's put into it's coming out of my pocket or me working 80 to 90 hours a week because I don't have any help and you can't find anybody that wants to work. So, you know, I think it's a great thing happening and I, I, I hope it really develops, but we really ought to be careful about what we're doing with these tax dollars because tax dollars are not free. If you don't believe me, look at the 33% increase on your utility bills that you have now that I have you know, went from $56 to $70 some dollars because it's not free. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, you don't want to, don't want that to happen. And, you know, in talking about renting a farmer's market for $1,500, that sounds grand. But let's bring the perspective, that's $18,000 a year. You can buy a lot of vegetables for $18,000 a year for a part-time business mm -hmm. that's only going to be open one day a week. Um, so that's that, that's another thing, you know. Maybe that could be better used in, in some other direction, but uh, I hope it does materialize. Uh, I think it's a great thing. I just think there should be a segregation there between our public tax dollars and the private enterprise, and um, or put parameters in place that one do one for one, do it one for all, and that's kind of hard to do, but um, that's just how I feel about it. And uh, let's see. Last but not least. Um, I hate to think that things are already predetermined, but when you looked at the budget that we skimmed over a while ago that was already pre-approved from the second adjustment that already has the funds appropriated to do this, I don't know if I'm wasting my breath up here right now or not, but I wanted my point to be heard. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, Beth <coughs> Matthews. <coughs> Six oh one Santa Bell Drive, Nashville. You know what? It's probably a good thing that the water bill situation has happened because now it's brought different people to come in here and to start investigating all the other things that's going on in our town, like the Nashville Junction. I wish my bill had gone up twenty dollars or thirty dollars, and I feel for people. My water bill, water bill went up from sixty five dollars to three hundred and thirty four dollars. I live alone, my grass is dead. <laughs> I mean, so it's not like I'm overdoing anything that I would normally be on do. And I received a letter saying that I needed to contact the town and which I've called and I've left a message, but still let it be known that um, what Mr. Hyde said is correct. You know, that the funds that we need to get the infrastructure in place before we start paying out additional funds to Mr. Hurt and his property. It is he, he is the he has purchased that property. It is his. 
it is not ours, the taxpayers, to reimburse him for an agreement that he willingly bought into for this property. We've actually, our family has hired an attorney and has asked several questions and has asked for several feedback from Mr. Hurt and his team and the town of Nashville, and we've never received one response. So where does it stop? We need communication, we need visibility, we need people that respond, and you know, I was thinking about this the other day, and I know this sounds, may sound very, very trivial to people, but if you watch HGTV like I do, you know that little show called Hometown? where those people are trying to build up their town and revitalize it and make people proud of where they live. That's, that's the town that I want. That's the town I grew up in, and that's the town I want to stay in. We need to be proud of where we come from and people undermining each other and taking situations for granted and pushing things under the table. That's not the way we are. That's not Nashville. Larry, did you need to speak again, or, or Larry Hyde? No. Okay, thanks. Okay, that, have I left anybody? That's everybody that had signed up. So at this time, I need a motion that we um, come out of um, the um, public hearing for the Nashville Junction. Do I hear a motion? I move that we come out of the public hearing. Louise Hinton. Kate Burns, second. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Larry Taylor, aye. aye. Lynn Hobbs, aye. Thank you very much. At this time, we'll uh, move on to our next item. Mayor, do you mind if we defer this to August 3rd for a decision? Yeah, we need to, do we have to take a vote on this one just like the other one? Yeah. Do I hear a motion that we defer this to August the 3rd according to the North Carolina statutes when you have um, a remote meeting. I move that we move this to August 3rd, Louise Hinton. Second, Larry. Kate Burns. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Larry Taylor, aye. Aye. Lynn Hobbs, aye. Thank you. So we'll move on to item six. This is our trees. <laughs> so um, I'm going to read this and then um, is there anyone here from the tree committee to speak tonight? I know um, Dr. Street flew out this morning, he and his wife. I'm going to read this, and then, um, Doritha, if you don't get an answer, we'll give you your turn. And I'm on the tree board, so I, oh, can, I can answer questions if you okay. have any, and, and maybe expand on things. As okay, you know. great. I'll read the report that we received, um, and then that you may ask Kate questions. The Washington Sh Street Trees, the review of the National Tree Board's recommendation on the Washington Street Trees and formulate a recommendation to give to the North Carolina Department of Transportation. The Town of Nashville Tree Board met on July 7, 2021 to review the two risk assessments completed along Washington Street and to make a recommendation to Council on how to proceed. The Tree Board's recommendation is as follows. Remove four mature trees, tree number, and I don't know what this will mean to you, 15, 11, 14, and 18, and they are marked with pink ribbons. Begin mulching around all trees along Washington Street as affordably as possible. Place barrier around each tree to keep mulch in place. Have North Carolina Cooperative Extension send samples of the fungus to labs for testing. Remove dead, dying replacement trees currently marked with pink ribbon. Prune three trees, tree number 16, 20, and 21, and these trees are listed as high priority and required pruning to mitigate risk by both uh, arborists. So uh, did that, any of that answer your question, Doretha? Um, yes, but I want to know when is it going to be done and is it coordinated with um, Duke Energy? Because they're, they're whacked them all over the trees off, and I don't want some of those trees to <coughs> Kate, can you answer that? It's not in coordination with Duke Energy, and I actually don't, I think maybe one of those that they hacked um, is actually one that's supposed to come down. I think the rest are not the ones that, that have already been affected. 
Um, as far as the timing of it, Randy, that's probably a question that you can answer. Sure. Well, if, if the council accepts the tree board's recommendation, um, you'll make a recommendation to, to the DOT to take those four trees out. We've already heard back from the DOT. They will not pay for the mulching around the trees. They will not pay to trim any of the trees. Uh, those things, if the council accepts that recommendation and want to go forward with, will be a, an expense or a cost to the town. And if, if you wanted to pursue that, staff can get prices on all that stuff and bring it back to the council. I think the tree board was thinking the mulch could be rather inexpensive. You know, uh, our chipper goes through town every week to chip some stuff. I don't know if that's the quality of chips you want to put around trees <coughs> on our main street, so to speak. Wouldn't that be smelly, some of it? It's all green material, and it, it would heat the, some of it permits when you put it in a pile. But um, I, I think we, you know, Camlar uh, on the east edge of town mm -hmm. makes colored chips, and uh, they may be willing if we ask them to donate a couple of dump truck loads, and then we could have volunteers who express a lot of interest in trying to save these trees, uh, show up on a Saturday and help with the mulch down uh, to save on costs. But those are the recommendations of the, the tree board. And if you want to pursue with those, we can work to get prices on them. Hey, can, can I ask a question? Certainly. Uh, my only concern about the, and I'm not an arborist either, my only concern is we had two supposedly arborists, licensed arborists to come in and, and survey the trees down Main Street. And did the tree board, is there any rationale that we went from 21 trees to four trees? Is it that much of a difference in the way they? The 21 was what need help overall. There was only actually eight recommendation for remo recommended for removal eight. for with okay. high risk. Okay. There were others that were rec recommended for removal over time that were moderate risk or low risk. But there was eight that were high risk that were recommended by the first one. The first gentleman I was told, um, and it's through the reports if you read them, um, he was looking at it from just the risk analysis um, portion of it, while the second gentleman um, was looking at it in more of how have these trees responded to the traumas that have occurred and, and is there a chance of rehab rehabilitation. He also said that these need to be reassessed every 15 months um, to see if his projections on how these trees are doing is accurate. Um, they also have differing um, opinions. The state recommends that any time that there's a fungus on a tree, they recommend immediately, immediate removal because the fungus um, can hollow out the tree and it can also um, create airborne spores that go from tree to tree to tree. The second gentleman um, has done 10 years of independent study where he found out that it's not necessary to do immediate removal. You might have a small portion of the tree that has a fungus on it where the tree can get rid of it itself um, or it might be a slow growing fungus. In that case, you would have the tree for another five years, so you don't need to remove it now, but you will in five years. So it was just two very different ways that they came about reviewing these things. Um, the tree board was equally um, perturbed by this, and they really um, they wanted to get that third opinion. And because we have the, the grant funding that, um, through the forestry program, there will be an opportunity to get a third opinion, at least on these, um, you know, nine questionable high-risk trees and possibly the ones that are moderate or lower risk um, where they can come in September, October, we're hoping, because the grant begins in September um, where they do the assessment. So we're hoping to get a third opinion in that assessment for these trees. So we're waiting on a third opinion before we move forward? Well, we're going to move forward with the ones that they agreed on. They agreed on three trees um, that were high-risk that should be removed, and then there was one additional one that was listed as high-risk by um, the first company, um, but was seen as a, a potential for growth by the second company. However, two replacement trees have been placed very close to that one, and they are thriving. They're doing really well, but they need sun. Mm -hmm. And so the recommendation is to remove the one that's in question because it doesn't look like it's uh, very healthy or that it will have any real chance of coming back anytime soon so that the other two replacement trees can then grow in its place. Okay. So the, that one extra one was recommended per the first man and the tree board, but not the second one. So we're moving forward with four. Right. And um, another 
arborist will come in and right, for inspect the them again later on. And exactly. I hope we don't tell him those. anything that's happened. Right. <laughs> don't even tell anybody who he is so right. nobody can contact right. or anything. But you know, um, my concern when I walked around with the first gentleman is what you just, I'm glad you looked at this, is we've got some little trees that are thriving and could be here for the later generations when these trees die. But they've got, we've got to get that canopy so they, off of them so they can get the sun. So I'm glad to hear that. So where do we need to go from here? Do I hear a motion? I move that we move forward with removing the four trees in question. And, and your time. name? Um, <laughs> can I just get a clarification on that? Are you just moving for the removal or are you moving for the mulching and, and those other things as well? Right now, just for the removal. Okay, because I just want to warn with the, with, with the remainder of those, both arborists stated that if we don't mulch like now, that we are going to see way greater problems with additional trees. So we're going to be right back in the same place with four more trees very shortly if we don't start doing this remedial mulching and um, pruning for safety so well i want to get back to the same position again uh, but we have to um, i mean we could we could move to have them price out mulching and pruning right. and i think that's what we're waiting for the trees need to come down right away right They're in bad shape. right okay the mulching we can get prices and you can make a second motion right. okay okay Okay, so um, I hear a motion for us to remove the four trees. Larry Taylor, I second that motion. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. aye. Kate Burns, aye. Larry Taylor, aye. Lynn Hobbs, aye. Thank you. Now, is there? Do I hear another motion to this yes, tree? I, I would like. I would like to also add a motion that we, after these four trees are removed, that we move forward with pricing, mulching, and who we get it from to, to go ahead and try to. Uh, show up the remaining trees that are in jeopardy. Louise Hinton seconds. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Kate Burns, aye. Larry Taylor, aye. Lynn Hobbs, aye. Thank you very much. May, may I ask just for a point of clarification, does that include the barriers as well? That were I think this, the whole rest of this list, you yeah. know, okay. for checking out the fungus, for pruning, we need prices on all of that too. Move forward. And I do want us to take care of our trees because that is a pretty part of Nashville, but we can't let them stand and fall and hurt people. We've got to get these little ones growing and, and preserve the ones that we can. Well, if you look at some of them, I don't see how they're still standing already. I don't, it's like the gentleman said too, people walking and limbs yeah. falling, it's, it, it's very scary. Yeah. All right, let's move along with item uh, 7A, um, Randy. The Nashville Junction Review and Inducement Agreement. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Well, as you know, because of uh, COVID-19 protocols, any public hearing on an item, you got to wait another 24 hours, and you guys defer decision on this till August 3rd. But did you want to have any discussion about what is in the inducement agreement between the proposed inducement agreement between the town? and Hurt LLC. As I mentioned before, this, this is a little more detail. Um, he's going to subdivide that property into two parcels. That, which he's going to offer a lease of 99 years to the town for the parking lot, the pavilion, and the performance area will be parcel two. The building and its outbuildings that is on that lot would be parcel one. He's going to expend the 1.2 million to rehabilitate that building into 12 suites leasing to commercial and retail businesses, upfit uh, two of the other three buildings for a farmer's market venue, and the one building, the one out building, tear down. Lease parcel two to the town for a pavilion, a parking lot, and audience, a dollar a year for 99 years, and then lease the farmer's market to the town for two years for 1500 a month. Uh, that, in addition to this inducement agreement, there are two lease agreements which go into more detail uh, about those properties to be leased. But uh, this is about the inducement agreement right now. And then uh, per the agreement, the town will lease parcel two from Hurt, uh, expend $275,000 to construct the approximately 125 lot parking lot, performing arts pavilion in the, in the grass audience area, 
and lease the farmer's market venue from her LLC to operate uh, farmer's market and other activities. So any of those terms you want to talk more specific about, we, we do have Mr. Hurt here this evening. If you have questions about the inducement agreement, the, the town attorney has gone over this inducement, had some recommendations for the change. Um, I, I have heard from one of the council with uh, some things that that council person wanted added, and what you have before you includes those. My, my concern with this inducement agreement is, is, as I go through it, we put dates and, and, and timelines for completing stuff, and I would like for the wording to change in reference to this pavilion that we're talking about constructing. Uh, I would like for that that term that language to be possibly a potential pavilion at a later date. Uh, we already we already have a stage for performing arts and stuff like uh, the lady spoke of, and the pavilion part. I think that's something we need to hold off on and use a temporary stage in the interim to see how that works out. Because it, I mean, we may have our first event out there and find out yet we don't want to go down this road, and then we've got to build a pavilion already built. So what you gonna do with it? We can use a temporary stage to see how it works out to begin with. As far as the farmers market, Nashville has tried twice to 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 go on board with a farmers market. And it has flopped twice. Uh, Can you expand on that? When did we try it and where did we try it? Well, we had it once out here at Nash Central, Nash Central School. Middle was school? Out there one time. At Glover Park. And at Glover, Glover Park. At, at Glover Park. And I want to say we had it down at Stony Creek Park one, one Saturday. But I can't be specific. But I know we had it at Glover Park. And it did not. And it did so not like work. a single event or... For a, well, a farmers market season, or? and I didn't go, and I didn't go out there to it, so I, I cannot say I saw firsthand. But I know it was out there for supposedly we were gonna have it out there like every Saturday, mm -hmm. and it didn't, it, it it didn't it didn't float, it didn't go. So uh, based on that, that's 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 a lot of money that even Mr. Hertz got to uh, recondition these buildings when we can have an an open open air farmers market in this parking lot just to see how it goes. And if it goes like we want it to and let and the citizens respond to it, then we can back up and say, okay, we need somewhere to put us indoor. So he can go ahead and do the rest of the uh, reconditioning of, of those old buildings out there. So I don't like, I don't like the terminology for the pavilion. I think it needs to be something like uh, a possible future pavilion which don't tie us to anything. And I don't think the $1,500 a month for a seasonal type activity, uh, if it was coming out of my pocket, I wouldn't do it either. Uh, and a lot of citizens feel, feel the same way about that. But I, I think 1500 is a little bit too much for, I mean, look at what this is gonna cost us in two years. Uh, we could do a whole lot of stuff with that money. That's my feelings about it. The pavilion and farmer's market, $1,500 a month is, is is quite a bit to not know whether or not it's gonna make it or not. And I mean, also, excuse me, I thought you finished, I apologize. I think I said enough, go ahead. Also, when a um, landlord reserves the right to utilize the leased areas when the property is not in use by the tenant for public private use, in other words, we would be paying $1,500 a month for a farmer's market, but if we weren't using it, um, the landlord is going to go use back and it. use it. I'm thinking. Can Mr. Hurt come up here and just explain what his intent was for that portion? Good evening, Council, uh, Madam evening. Mayor. Um, as far as being able to utilize the, the farmer's market area, 
Um, the intent is for the merchants that's going to be utilizing that property when the, when it's not being used. Obviously, we check with the farm with the uh, town of Nashville, but so that maybe those merchants can utilize those sheds maybe for outdoor dining. Um, food trucks could easily pull around and have access to those tea sheds, which obviously would be on a concrete slab um, and and you know be under <coughs> shelter so that they could potentially use that. Uh, we are kind of in a rough negotiate. Well, we're we're getting closer, but we're still negotiating these things. But the intent would be for those merchants that's going to be uh, occupying those 13 commercial spaces to be able to utilize them, uh, you know, like I said, for outdoor dining or for something like something along those lines. Do you not th do you not think we should go ahead and get that old building supply building reconfigured for those 12 suites to go in there and get them occupied before we go out and build something on the outside? Get them there first, and then we move forward. Uh, I mean, that's going to be a year out. You know, and it's not one, it's, it's not 12, it's 13, uh, and it's, it's not 1.2, it's 1.65 now. Well, uh, that's a year out. We, that's going to be a year out. That's, the, that's just from a construction phase. The intent was to get the farmer's market up and running as soon as we can so we can start generating some excitement and, and, and provide a service to the people in the community. Um, you know, we talked about having uh, that farmer's market within walking distance to a lot of the people in this community, uh, as well as seeing if it's going to work, as well as seeing if this is something that the town of Nashville wants to continue to support. And that's why we were talking about a two-year lease agreement, not a five, which is what all the other merchants are going to be entering into. And may I just tell you something that concerns me, Michael, mm -hmm. is that Nash County has told us when we can have our farmer's market. So that means they've got theirs going over in Rocky Mount on the days when people can really go, and we just have a certain amount of time. That's what gives me heartburn. You know, when we're told we want Nashville to prosper, but then we're told we can only meet on certain days. Like, what days were they? We were going to do um, Friday afternoon evenings and potentially Saturday like afternoon because their market goes until noon. But that's only if we want to utilize for free the farmer's market manager at Rocky Mount. If we wanted to go on Saturday morning, that's fine. We would just have to hire Our somebody to manage person. the farmer's market. Now, Cass Day has already started their farmer's market. In addition to the $1,500 a month, we're already leasing. Yeah. Keep in mind, too, that Cass Day has already started a farmer's market, too. Yeah. I just, I, I looked back at several of the things that we've done over the years. We have a downtown national market analysis um, that was done, and we have this greater downtown enhancement study that was done by East Carolina University, um, and then by an outfit out of somewhere in the RTP area, where we paid to have them come in and talk with our citizens, and we paid for them to come and review our town back in 2009. And in here, talks about a farmer's market. It talks about public-private investment. It talks about reinvesting in old, older historic buildings and trying to revitalize them. It talks about inducements. It talks about all of the things that we're talking about today. It talks about economic, and economic development and how to do it. <clears throat> we then entered into that economic development action plan in 2011, but nothing was actually done. This is another thing that was put up on a shelf that mentioned all of the things that we're trying to do here for the junction, trying to create additional retail, trying to create additional activities for families, trying to pull in people from outside for tourism, trying to increase our tax base. Then we have here, Nashville, North Carolina, 2019, the NC Main Street and Rural Planning Center. Again, this is another set of professionals who came in you know what they talked about? They talked about our desire for a farmer's market. They talked about our desire to have more restaurants here and how these were all weaknesses, that we didn't have the restaurants, we didn't have the family activities, we didn't have the things that our citizens were looking for. These are all based on focus groups. These are all based on pe discussions with um, in, uh, people who are invested in the community, citizens as well as business owners and all of that. We now have March 2020 where we have the Downtown Nashville Economic Vitality Plan. And again, this is another huge book that talks about all of those things that we're trying to do right now with the junction. And each one says, you're not going to expend all of this money to find out all of this information and use all these professionals just to have it sit on a shelf or just not to take action. We then have Town of Nashville Comprehensive Plan Steering Committee. 
And again, all of these things are mentioned in here. This is 2009 to 2021. We've been talking about doing something just like this. We talked about the fact that the Rocky Mount Mills and the Rocky Mount Farmers Market are competitors and the fact that we're losing people to those areas. And if we had something in Nashville, several of these studies talk about how it would be extremely successful. And they were, again, all based on citizen input, on surveys that went out, on people coming in and, and speaking their mind and filling out forms and taking, taking part in this, this community um, involvement. So I feel like we've talked about this so many times, even just with this board, with, with trying to figure out how do we attract people here? How do we make our, our, ourselves a desirable place to be? How do we get more people to move here so that we increase our, our sales taxes, we increase our property tax base? These are the things that the professionals have told us work. These are the things our citizens have told us they want. So. I, I think it's a great plan to try out the farmer's market for two years. If we're wrong about this, I will be shocked, but it's two years and then it's over. As far as the parking lot, Michael has purchased this property and he can do whatever he wants with this property. He can demolish the historic building that's on the premises. He can, you know, he can, he can open up uh, several different things there that have nothing to do with increasing the benefits to our, our citizens that have to do with helping us to create an environment that we're trying to create. So we are, yes, inducing him to do something different, which is to create a wonderful atmosphere of some light music, a farmer's market that sells you know, local honey and, and anything else that you want to get, and be able to shop in these little areas, get your hair done, or eat some food, or, or grab a drink, whatever it may be. And these kind of all go hand in hand. So if we're going to sit here and pick it apart every time, we might as well take all of these things and put them back on the shelf. Put them on the shelf. And just so you understand, we've got roughly nine people right now looking to, to, to sign leases right now um, out of 13. And we haven't even advertised this. And most of the people happen to be from Nashville. So, I mean, we're talking, and, and we've already got one business that's in there operating, which is mine. I've moved my construction company into that company. So we've already created three jobs and looking to create more. So it is an economic growth and development driver for an area of this community that's been distressed for a long time. And so, you know, we're looking to invest significant of our capital of our own to try to help revitalize this historical landmark for the community. And we're happy to be a part of it. Any other questions? For I, I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not totally. I'm not against the farmers market. What I'm against is Mr. Hurt investing a lot of his money into redoing those shelters out there and putting lights and putting cement and all that stuff out there, and then it doesn't work. What I'm saying, let's have an open air, open area type farmers market, and if it goes, then. I would feel more comfortable and hopefully you would feel more comfortable with building it knowing that it would work. Let's get the let's get the uh let's get the building supply building with those tenants in there. Start that. And you notice I didn't say anything about the parking lot because I know the parking lot is is is, is gonna be essential. And there has not been any conversation about what's going on across the street from from this area, from this location. So I, I, I just think doing all doing all this construction with the farmers market is and the pavilion is probably getting ahead of ourselves. Well, I think the, the pavilion was listed to be 2023 so that we could do a temporary right. yeah, situation mm -hmm. for the 2021. But I'm looking at 2021 stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the farmer's market, I mean, as long as there's whatever the, the, the vendors would need, you know, as far as electric um, and things like that, I, I mean, we can, we can rehash what, what all goes into that. But we've already taken it down from, you know, having the bathroom and, and having it full blown. Um, but we can continue to figure out how to make that work for the two years. Well, we can't vote on it until August the 3rd. So um, I, I have a question. Are the people leasing properties, on, are they, is this contingent on the pavilion and the farmer's market and everything? It is. I mean, so so there's there's a couple of different businesses 
that the, the, the people that, I'm not gonna say any names, but there's companies that are excited about doing like a wine and beer garden type situation or, or a tap house, something to that effect, that the pavilion is, is essential. I mean, you got to, you know, we've got an outdoor patio that we're gonna build that's gonna be adding on to this facility that's gonna be facing that direction towards the parking lot where that outdoor patio is. So you're gonna have a community area where people can come and, and you know, have a drink, eat a meal outside with their family and be able to listen to music. So, I mean, that's one of the, I mean, that it is, that's, that's key. I mean, that's how, that's how I pitched it from the beginning that, you know, we're looking to do a public-private partnership. We're gonna have a public, uh, public parking lot. We're gonna have a pavilion outside and we're gonna have a farmer's market. And all that is gonna generate excitement. You know, picture wall on the side of it, it's all gonna generate excitement. Um, I'm not saying that we can't get the places leased. Uh, that being said, when you start talking about having that green space area, you start talking about having that outdoor anthem theater, you're really gonna have people gravitate and wanna be a part of that. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but there, I think there are gonna be tenants that we have currently that are in line that, that are, have, express, that have expressed interest that would probably not be as excited about being a part of that because you're gonna lose that, that element that I think is, it is vital to, to that kind of complex that we've, that we've been kind of pitching to everybody. Any other questions? I mean, we do have Nash County's uh, Farmers Market folks here this evening. If you would like to hear from them on what they feel it takes to have a successful Farmers Market, venue is very important. Who's? Okay, come on up then, please. Marie Brown, she's the Farmers Market Manager for Nash County's Farmers Market at the Mills. Hi, how y'all doing this evening? Good. And Sandy Hall is um, Director of Cooperative Extension here in Ash County. Um, so I would heard that y'all had a farmer's market or attempted a farmer's market in Nashville in years past. Mm -hmm. So one of the most important things about a farmer's market is the location and that the location stays the same. I've known several places that have had a farmer's market and they have changed the location several times. And each time they do that, they have a drop in attendance. Also, in addition, you know, a highly visible place. So I've heard um, the park, Stony Creek Park. Nobody sees that park. Um, they may go down there, but it's not highly visible to cars that pass by. So I think um, where the Nashville Junction is gonna be is a great location because it's right off the exchange. I will tell you too, you need somebody dedicated to the farmer's market. You can't just say, hey, we're gonna have a farmer's market. People that are interested in selling, why don't you come? You have to have structure to it. There has to be rules. There has to be somebody in charge of it or else there's gonna be a huge decline uh, in attendance from vendors and customers. If you don't have structure, they're not gonna know what's happening. Also, it has to be marketed very well. So there has to be some dollars you know, for marketing. One of the best ways that I market the farmer's market um, in Rocky Mount is through Facebook. And that's not very expensive to market it that way. So does anybody have any questions that they wanna ask me about the farmer's market? Because I have managed, this is my seventh season managing a farmer's market. I've been, this is my third season at the farmer's market in Rocky Mount. I actually started another farmer's market in another community close by. So I started that one and it's still going at this point. Is that one, is that place larger than Nashville or about our size? It's about the same size. So it's about the same size okay. as Nashville. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any questions for her? Well, thank you so much okay. for sharing. We appreciate thank it. You. So um, council, we will, uh, we've already <clears throat> taken a motion that we'll vote on this August the 3rd at our August the 3rd meeting. Yeah, he did. Larry, how did he? Larry? Yeah. I just reiterate what I said. Can you just come to the mic? Sorry. They would need to pick you up on the minutes. Well, I still love it the same place. <laughs> <laughs> well, remind us where it is. <laughs> 113 Meredith Woods Court. 
Oh, I still go back. I still go back and say what I said. I'm not against. I like what that Larry said. I'm, I mean, it makes sense to let's get maybe think about well, doing the right. uh, building yes, supply. Sir, thank you. Get that to go on and see what happens. You can always spend money later rather than spending all that money and obligating the money up front for something that you don't know is going to work. And uh, and I I believe that uh, that the council uh, these consulting companies and by they all recommend uh, you know the farmers market and all that. But I can tell you one thing they recommend too: they recommend water and sewer. And if, if something if we I, I still go back and say that you've got to get the water and sewer straightened out. And Larry, may I say something to you here? Sure. And I am not putting anybody down by any means. I don't play that game. But Larry, our water pipes and water is 100 years old. What happens to your body if you don't take care of it over 100 years and go to the doctor and take your supplement? That's where we are with our infrastructure right now. I believe that. We've got That's pipes. What I'm saying. We don't even know where the pipes are. You're preaching to and the we, choir. So we are, and know. we do have funds allocated. We do. Um, we for have finding out of funds all of these allocated things. to get that right. Yes. Well, it's just uh, you hear people. You've heard the people tonight that have, you know, uh, and there's no telling how many more you're going to be hearing from about. I, you know, I can't deal with this water bill, and I can't deal with the sewer bill. And if it's, if you, I'm just saying, get a handle on that. You know that you know that you know we're okay on this because you know what happened you, you say we made mistakes i don't know who made the mistakes but they were made and uh and now we're so we're reaping we're reaping what was sown you know and, it, uh, and i'm just saying let's get a handle on the water and sewer to make doggone sure our infrastructure is so that we can do other things because if you don't have water and sewer you can do whatever you want to do, but it's not going to amount to hill of beans. Right. Thank you. So we'll vote on this August the 3rd. Let's go to uh, our next item. This is our fire station um, that we desperately need and are hoping to get. <laughs> Randy? This is more important than anything. This is in, in the uh, agenda packet is the agenda report. Um, We've been talking about two potential sites for this fire station for, for quite a while. Uh, we, we now know what each party wants in order to convey that land to the town. Wait just a minute. You're talking in the background. We can't hear him. So would you please um, give, him your attention, please. give him your attention? So the, the first site is Clayton Homes, four acres right on Eastern Avenue. In order to get that, um, we would, they would sell us a portion of the road that they haul their finished houses out. So they're agreeable to selling that to the town provided we provide them with a new haul road. Moving the haul road then necessitates moving the parking area where they park their finished vehicles. So we have to build a haul road and a two acre parking lot for them in order to get that. The, the cost on that and the site preparation for that Clayton Homes property is 1,190,000. The other property is a three and a half acre site along the railroad track south of Walmart, which East Point Avenue would have to be extended to to get to, along with water and sewer. And the cost of extending that water and sewer and street and the preparation for that property is uh, $1,881,000. So I, I guess to staff's looking. question yeah. to the council, are you interested in paying that kind of money for either one of the properties? If not, we can see if we can find something else. Uh, we, we got a hint on another potential uh, property that came up this week. I haven't had a chance to develop it much, but wanted to bring these back to you and see what, what the time, what, what your thoughts are. Uh, Randy, uh, the East Point site, that's a new site. That's not the old site. The old site was two acres near the railroad that would be approached from Oak Level Road. When did this one come up? It, well, it was always on the north side of the railroad tracks, Louise. I, I guess I apologize if I hadn't made that clear. What David Rose had offered was a, was a site on the north side of the railroad track. 
Okay, but it was two acres, and here it's three and a half acres. Yeah, two, and two and acres you approach more. it from East Point and not from Oak Level. You know, before it was a half mile road from Oak Level Road to the railroad track. And this is a, approaching it from East Point Avenue and Correct. extending that road. And it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't go over the railroad track to the south to Oak Level Road at this time. This, this cost is only to get from where East Point Avenue is right now up to the railroad track. And then that four acres is there. So how much road would we be responsible for developing? I think there's like 600 or 800 feet. Okay. Now, the expenditure of that money would have some public benefit because <laughs> then it, you know, there, there's another phase two of the, of the um, I'm trying to remember the name of that subdivision, new subdivision behind yes. Food Line. The name escapes me right now. But anyway, if you have no interest in that, let it be known and we'll pursue a whole different site. The, this one preferably already has water and sewer right in front of it, already has access to Oak Level Road. I'd say check another site. Yes. Do I hear a motion that we just would like for him to Cancel. Before we put out put out a motion, you're saying that the one for uh, East Point that, that road would not go all the way over to Oak Level Oak Level Road. These costs do not include extending into Oak Level Road. I mean, there's pros and cons, obviously, with both those sites. There that, truly is. That was a piece of road that you were trying to get DOT to put in. Right. They really right. covered cover the cost. And it was a half mile. Half mile. It's actually right out. I think it ended up being about three quarters of a mile, mm -hmm. okay. all the way across that to where East Point is now. Okay. Now that application still is with the DOT, and now that they got funding again, they may fund that. But it could be five to seven years. Yeah. Before and we they can't get wait. We, we can't wait that long. I would, uh, <laughs> I would enter, offer a motion that we uh, table this right now and, and, and empower Randy to right. and the chief to research this new, new new place we got to handle and any other properties i mean it's just Anything. mind boggling that we can't purchase property for 400,000 or less um for three well, acres of property keep people safe. right yeah. um is there e could we, is there even a possibility of trying to negotiate with some of this open land that's just outside of town and then annex it in there there is um most likely talking to the same property owner gotcha <laughs> Can I, can I answer something on that? Yeah. When, when we start looking at stations, it's like a circle. You've got a spot that you've got to keep that fire station right. in mm -hmm. because of the insurance issues that go on. For us to give insurance to the people in the Gully District, also to provide more coverage here in town, we have to stay within that circle. That's the reason why it, mm -hmm. it is so difficult to try to get on that side of town, but we've got to stay within that circle. That way I can make it work out for everybody. Everybody gets a benefit. Not only the town people, but the pe people of Gully who their fire tax was raised three cents last year to cover this cost. Mm -hmm. They they get a benefit out of this too. So, so that's is the, the reason why is the new the new uh, new lead within that. It's circle? still in that. I've got it's in that circle. I said let's look at that circle. Right, Larry, you look have a it. motion. I second the motion. Louise Hinton. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. aye. Keith Burns aye. Mary Taylor aye. Lynn Hobbs aye. Thank you very much. Well, Randy, I did have one question about the cost of one uh, million, excuse me, uh, the uh, Rose property. Was the site plan included in that figure? Site preparation is included in that area. So all, you know, the, the, the leveling, the grading, getting it ready to put a building on is included in both those totals, totals okay. for each one of those locations. I know it was broken out in the first one mm -hmm. for the Clayton Homes, but it was not broken out in Correct. the... Correct. Our, our engineer broke it out for Clayton Homes so you can see the improvements on their property versus the site. Yeah. And I would remind everybody that we have a 1.4 million budget for this. So when you look at those figures... Mm -hmm. That's the That's true. Not good. So we, um, Randy, according to the council, will you investigate other properties, please? Yeah. Let us move on to our next item on the agenda, and that is our sewer flow meter with Rocky Mount. And um, we have with us um, Courtney Gamble with the Wooten Company regarding the sewer meter at Old Carriage Road, and so she's going to fill us in on that. To so I'm going to turn it over to you, Courtney. Yes, thank you. Do you have a preference to be here or over here? Can you hear either way? What's best for you? We can. I can. No preference here. I don't mind standing. Okay. Of my presentation up here. 
here, well, with one tweak, uh, Google Maps led me astray and, and advised me Stony Creek did not have an E, and Randy corrected me. So the handouts that you have have been corrected. Um, I just wanted to come and give you a brief overview of the study that we've done at the sewer or at the Stony Creek metering station. This is your metering point for your sanitary sewer to Rocky Mount. I think everybody in this room has probably been brought up to speed or is keenly aware of the higher sewer bills that you've received over this last year. So this kind of evolved and that's why you'll see these three stages here. The original intention was just a volume review and you know, it was kind of an onion. As we learned other things, we looked into other things. Uh, so we move on to page two here. The first thing that was done was an installation of a meter that Clearwater 8 provided uh, that was rented by the town. The intention was to install this for three months and to verify the existing meter is reading accurately with a secondary meter to kind of compare. One month in, you see the graph on the left there, about seven GPM off from one another, over 7,000 plus data points. Uh, so in general, they were pretty close which wasn't you know, originally what we anticipated to see. But doing, during site visits, we theorized there's some times where this vault is surcharging or backing up and levels are getting pretty high. And it appears that the volume is really slowing down or the sewer's not really moving. So investigating that with Rocky Mount, we learned that during these surcharge events, which anytime that vault reaches 11 inches, the existing meter is now submerged and it can't read underwater. So they default to a two and a half cubic feet per second during that entire surcharge period. So over these, this uh, three month cycle, we had 313 hours of that surcharge. So you can think if that you know, surcharge period was off, since it's just an assumption, that could be something to look into. So that was our next step. We installed a second meter, which is one, oh, move us one more please. Thanks, sir. So we installed a second meter. This one goes inside the pipe, and that allows you to meter flow even if you submerge the other meter and see those low velocities. And the preliminary findings were that that actually did kind of support the theory. If you look at the non-surcharge time, so that's kind of your average flow period, your velocity is a little over two feet per second. During these surcharge periods, your velocity drops to 1.3 feet per second or so. Not sure what's causing that, and we'll get to root cause later, but you know, it's not being able to get downstream at the speed it is during these non-surcharge events. And you'll see the average flow rate during those surcharges in the, the bottom right of that upper table was 2.18 CFS. Now, remind you, Rocky Mountain has been charging 2.5 CFS as kind of a standard during those periods. So we got about 122 hours of surcharge during three events while this meter was installed for about a month. And if you look at the table there below, I gave you some estimation of just what that means for the town. And we've presented this to Rocky Mount as well, so they understand how significant this is to the town of Nashville. So if that was metered uh, versus using the two and a half CFS assumption, there's about a 5,000, little over $5,000 savings just in that one month and that 122 hours of surcharge because the difference between just assuming a two and a half CFS flow versus getting you know, an accurate flow. So then we kind of learned through that process as well, or I think you know, Randy and, uh, and Sam had shared with me, there's a set, another component here to this that I hadn't seen, and that's your organic loadings. So your sewer bills are two separate components. It's your volume, which is the flow we just talked about. Then there's also organics, which is TSS, CBOD, kind of standard wastewater constituents, uh, lots of acronyms. Um, those are <coughs> measured at milligrams per liter. And if you are high on those in a month where your flow is also high, they kind of compound one another because you are then taking that flow and compounding it against uh, something that is flow based to turn into a poundage. So we looked at about a year's worth, actually a 12 months worth of your surcharge. So the left side of this table is your existing, your, the flow that was actually billed, the cost of that flow, and the cost of the organic loading. Just if that, for example, if that 2.2 CFS is accurate in lieu of 2.5, you see at the bottom there how, how your numbers change. So for a 12 month, month period, that's getting close to about $70,000 if you adjust that, that factor. So again, we presented this to Rocky Mount just as a preliminary discussion and stating, 
this opens con conversation and this gives pause and what can we do to move forward? And so they've come back and provided a suggestion of how to move forward. So Rocky Mount has given a couple steps that they would agree to, and, and rightfully so, just three surcharge events, seeing that 2.2 CFS, they weren't comfortable with changing the 2.5 moving forward. We did talk about a full-time meter installation, but there are ownership, operation, and maintenance costs in perpetuity for something like that. And these meters that go in your pipe, they're not ideal because this, the nature of sewer, they get ragged up, they get fouled up, they have to be cleaned on a regular basis. And you'll see that in these costs down below. So what uh, Rocky Mounts proposed is that Nashville continue to monitor, put it, install another meter, monitor through the end of the year, and then at that point they would feel comfortable they have enough data to reevaluate that two and a half factor and determine what to use for the next two years moving forward after that is what they uh, is the time frame that they recommended so we got two different costs clearwater is the representative that we worked with through the, through the study for the temporary meters unfortunately their cost is quite high because it's a brand new install with controls metering electric you know just everything we also found out during our discussions with Rocky Mount, though, that the existing meter out there has the ability to plug in one of these in-pipe meters, which takes away a lot of that install cost because you're kind of using the existing infrastructure. They still need to main be maintained quarterly because, as I said, they're not ideal for sewer flow, so to make sure they're reading accurately, someone has to pull it, clean it, put it back. We think we, both reps recommended that would happen quarterly. So you see your breakdown of cost here of those options. Um, the total to do the delta systems, i.e. add on to the Rocky Mount metering system, would be approximately $7,000 because they did not include shipping or tax in their original quotes. The Clearwater install would be about $15,000 all in because they did include you know, their tax and shipping. So I think the, I think a great thing to do to move forward would be to consider it adding on to that Rocky Mount meter and continuing to investigate. Um, we don't have enough data to 100% prove 2.2 is the right number. It could end up at 2.4, it could end up at two, it could go up. I mean, there, until we get the data, we can't say for sure. But I think that there's enough that it's worth investigating, especially as you see how it carries through your, your metering and your billing, how that affects not just your flow, but your, search, your organic surcharge as well. It compounds and it can become quite a bit of money for the town. And then lastly, this is just uh, something that uh, town staff and I have, have discussed a couple times. Really, the, the long-term thing here is to address the root cause. What is causing this unit to surcharge? It should, you know, it's not intended to function that way. It's intended to flow kind of freely, and that's why this unit above the flume can read on a regular period. So the ways to do that are to chase I and I, both up and downstream, <laughs> investigate any potential downstream blockages that are kind of keeping the sewer from discharging in these high flow times and lowering that velocity, which would be working with, um, you know, Rocky Mount, of course. The flume hydraulics themselves, it's meant for 2MGD. Um, flumes are tricky. They're tricky uh, to, to monitor, and if they're not sized properly or if you have kind of spikes in flow. So look at those flume hydraulics, and then also my understanding, more to the organics component is there have been some industrial users um, in the system that have brought in some high organics, TSS, CBOD. I think that Rocky Mount is taking in one of them into their significant industrial user program, which will then come off of your bill separately. And hopefully, you know, if you continue to investigate those and see that there's any other industrial users that may have those high organics, that can also hopefully help get there. I'll open up for questions. I ran through it kind of quick um, in, in respect of your time with a, with a long meeting tonight, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have or backtrack to any of the pieces of the data. The chart on page four. Yes, ma'am. Can we just go over that a little bit? Sure. It's, it's a big one. <laughs> okay, so this is the three columns on the left is the billing from Rocky Mount to the town of Nashville for those 12 months. We've removed Cefi, who was a previous industrial user, so it was apples to apples with you know, what the billing should have seen. And what that is is your original billing has 
the regular periods of time, and then it has a two and a half CFS factor at <laughs> any point that vaults above 11 inches, which is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of data points. A couple, actually, I got 21,000 or so just in three months. Um, so then we took that same calculation. We didn't change anything with your organic loading. All we did was switch that factor to 2.2 CFS just for comparison, because that's what we saw during that uh, surcharge period with the secondary meter that was installed. And the three columns to the right is reworking that math of what your bill could have been at that 2.2 CFS. Okay. Just to give you the example, now I can't say, I can't promise that over the period of time of this next three, four months of sampling through the end of the year, it'll fall right at 2.2, that could fluctuate a little bit. But I wanted you to see how, the, how it affects your monthly bills and your total bills over a year uh, so you understood why that cost in that second meter installation might be worthwhile to you. So Can the you difference, sorry, yeah. Excuse me, the difference ahead. of the billing with CFI and without CFI is... C CFI is already removed from all of these numbers. Okay. What they what they do with the industrial user is they monitor their flow and okay. their organic they come, so say CFI was $1,000, right? They had a huge organic loading, but a very small flow. Okay. Well, then when it makes it to your vault, that huge organic loading, it's diluted a little, but it's still above your minimum, but your flow's so high, their surcharge bill's 1,000, yours was 60,000. And so it is coming off of it, and it is being removed, but just due to the nature of that type um, of billing, and having the high flows during those periods. I mean, you guys were just, you know, struggling with those organic charges. Okay. Any other questions? What is our investment so far in this um, calibration on full carriage road? Um, so engineering fee, I can say, but the meters were the two meters that have been installed so far have been contracted directly through the city, and I can't recall what your first install was. If, do you recall off the top of your head? $2,700. I think, yeah. I don't know if I have a copy of the, the original installs there. I only coordinated with the supplier for the future installs. The original installs were outside of our contract and the, the town had them installed. Um, and then the engineering fee so far has been, mm -hmm. no, not off the top of your head. Well, I was asking Lee. Asking Lee, <laughs> yeah. It was some time ago. It was actually last September that we were kicking this off. So it's been a, a like I said, you know, we, we intended one thing and things have evolved. Um, so I don't know your all-in cost at this point. We did about a $12,000 budget. We did a budget measure. It was less than 20000 I think, for the whole project. Do you want to check with Lynn just to make sure she's still with us? Lynn, are you still yeah, with us? Woman. I am still here. She's here. <laughs> I can check on that and get back with you. Okay. Thank you so very much. If there are no other questions, so um, <coughs> Council, do you want us to receive this and recommend um, to continue to see how we can reduce the town's treatment costs? Mayor, if I may suggest, could we get a motion and second from the council to proceed with the purchase of, not the purchase, the installation of the, uh, the Delta system. Flow, velocity flow meter, uh, which Courtney said was going to run about $7,000 from Delta Systems Environmental. And then we'll get that put in before hurricane season hits here and we'll keep it in place for the remainder of this year. That should give us more data with which then to reapproach the city of Rocky Mountain and say that your 2.5 factor hopefully is, is too high. It needs to be two. Now, when they get that data, will they only adjust the bill going forward or have they talked about any sort of reimbursement? No. No, no reimbursement. I mean, it's been mentioned, uh, alluded to, uh, and the answer is no. Okay. Based on the study that was done um, by Courtney and her team, they did adjust those bills. Okay. Those okay. The most recent that. ones they had billed correctly based on the metering that we have. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, I make the motion that we that we do that installation. Do I hear a second? 
Louise Hinton seconds. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Yep. Mm. Lynn Hobbs, aye. Larry Taylor, aye. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to keep a close watch on how much we're investing in all of this so that we understand our return on investment. Right. Absolutely. Okay, our next, and thank you so very much, Courtney, for the report. We appreciate it. Our next item on our agenda is uh, the Windy Oak Drainage Improvement Project. Randy? Well, we have our... our Town engineer Kevin Barnett with Stocks Engineering here, and uh, he designed this uh, system and let it out for bid. And we've got three bids, and Kevin, I'll turn it over to you. Good evening, Mayor. Cancel. Um, I'm going to try to be extremely quick. Um, This is concerning the Windy Oak drainage project, and if you guys remember, this is the um, area of drainage that flooded multiple subdivisions in the, the last main event we had at the end of last year, and um, council approved to move forward with um, designing that project and, and obtaining those bids. So seal bids were received for the Windy Oak drainage project um, on July the 1st. Um, bids were solicited under the formal bid process with advertisements in the Rocky Mount Telegram the greater diversity news and multiple online plan rooms. Um, Stocks Engineering also invited 10 local contractors who might be interested in the project. There were three bidders that um, were provided on bid day and a copy of the bid tabulation has been provided to the town and I think to you guys as well. The apparent low bidder um, was BCS contractors with a base bid of $306,524 with an alternate amount um, for alternate one of $39,000. The alternate amount was for going downstream of Lower Springs Drive and removing the existing riprap ditch and replacing that with a concrete ditch for easier maintenance. So while we were there already working, that was just an easy thing to add. Um, so right now we are currently exploring um, other options to provide a more reasonable price alternate one. Um, right now, Stocks and Dreams not believe that that's a, a good price for the town to do that and we think we have other alternatives to come back potentially and, and look at that at a later date. Um, but we have examined the bid documents um, from BCS. We found them to be acceptable and we have verified that BCS contractors is operating under license number 53835, which is currently active. Um, so we therefore recommend that the town of Nashville enter into a contract with BCS contractors for the Windy Oak drainage project in the amount of $306,524. Thank you, Kevin. Do I hear a motion that we approve this? I had a question. Okay. Kevin, at some point I recall when we were doing the budget, 283000 was a figure. Do you recall that? Yeah, we do. So the original um, engineer's estimate when the project, I guess the scope was originally done, was like $316,000. And I think Randy may have budgeted a little more than that for the project. When we actually designed the project, we went through and took the line items that we were bidding out and put what we thought were current market numbers on those unit prices, and that's where we came up with the 285, and on bid day it came in at 306. So uh, again, part of it was uh, we didn't have a huge interest um, from contractors. Again, we invited 10 personally, but then we advertised in multiple locations and really only had three to, that were interested. Um, so market had a lot to do with that, I think, um, and then obviously just interest in the project. I'm assuming that um availability of of certain materials has to play a role well, in that as well th there's no doubt so i mean obviously a lot of this is drainage pipe um, right. which obviously is has come into a little bit of a concern of obtaining materials and, and i i know that had a little bit to do with it but like i said i mean just right now the when you're trying to budget anything we we took the original budget which we're under but then we tried to apply unit prices based on bids that we received a, about a month earlier and obviously prices continue to escalate monthly so that's i think that's kind of where we are <laughs> Thank you so much. Any more questions for Kevin? What is the pleasure of the board? I move that we go with BCS contractors for the 306, um, but hold off on that alternate and see what kind of investigation can lower those numbers. Louise Hinton seconds. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 No. Lynn Hobbs, aye. Okay, it is a motion is carried, so proceed with the project. Our next item on the agenda is um, 
with Police Chief Anthony Puckett with the Governor's Highway Safety Grant. Madam Mayor, Council. Um, before I begin to explain what this grant is, and, and we've already voted to, uh, uh, you've already voted to allow us to put in for the grant, I want to recognize Captain Winston. Uh, this is a, a daunting task when you're putting in for a traffic grant. There's a lot of research, a lot of information that needs to be gathered. Captain Winston did all this himself. Um, <clears throat> and according to the information gathered, before we go into the particulars of the funding, we are Nash County. We are 13th in fatality ranking for crashes in <coughs> North Carolina. There's 100 counties. We rank 13th. We rank 16th in alcohol fatality crashes. Um, in unrestrained fatality crashes, we rank 15th. In speed-related fatalities, we rank 13th. In a young driver involved fetal, um, uh, fatal crashes, we rank 14th. That's out of 100 counties. We've had two fatalities in the last six months on 64 bypass. So that is the purpose of this grant, is to dedicate an officer to help deter careless, reckless, speeding, alcohol-related crashes. Um, when Captain Winston applied for the grant, it was prior to the study that our HR director did for the, for the pay study. So the, the salary he has in there uh, is less than what the salary we make right now is. Um, so the numbers that you have, the total project cost for the first year is $108,000. That is including $54,000 and some change for personnel costs, $54,000 and some change for other direct costs. The federal amount covered, they will be paying $92,000 um, for both of those uh, entities. And what we would be responsible for the first year would be approximately $16,000. Uh, you should have in your packet uh, a reassessed amount for the salary. I had to run the numbers, so I think it adds about $4,000 for the first year is what we, we would be responsible for. What we need is a resolution from the council to move forward with this. Um, and then we, in turn, once that, once that passes, turn that resolution back to the Governor's Highway Safety Program, and they need that prior to September so they can say, yes, you're good to go. Any questions for um, Chief Puckett? I just had a comment. Um, if I can find my place. When I was looking at the numbers on page, it's 137 or 2 of 7 for this. Um, year 2018 for occupant protection citation, um, we had 24. 2020, we had 63. For DUI citations in 2018, we had 18. In 2020, we had 110. And then speed citations, it went from 196 in 2018 to 323 in 2020. Um, so I just wanted to say great job. I mean, these are all really high risk factors in our community. And I think um, just looking at those numbers, it's, in, it's incredible the job that the police department's been doing. Well, thank you. And, the, and, and we have a very productive department. They're very, you know, sometimes you have to hold the reins back a little bit, but they're very productive. They're willing to work. And I, I, I attribute that to them. Um, and obviously what this would do is dedicate a traffic unit officer to do nothing but traffic because uh, there's a gentleman that left who was in the meeting. He, he, he's texted me multiple times about dirt bikes in his area and his subdivision. Um, we send an officer out there. The officer sits out there trying to find the dirt bike or the traffic violation, and then the officer gets a call for service, and then the officer has to leave. This would alleviate that because this officer is dedicated to nothing but traffic. So that would help some of that. Chief Puckett, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do we patrol the bypass? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the, the, it's in the city limits. So it's from Old 64 to Red Oak Road is what we patrol. Within the city limits? Yes, ma'am. But the, the bypass I'm talking about, you know, out on the four Well, 64, the six, 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 64 bypass. Um, uh, when, when, when I first came here, Highway Patrol was taking a lot of the wrecks on 64, but some of the officers were issuing citations. So what we did is we went into an arrangement with Highway Patrol. If we're going to issue citations, then we're also going to take the wrecks. So therefore, we started, I mean, we were already issuing citations, but we, we went ahead and started taking the wrecks on 64 as well. But we don't regularly patrol. We, y yes, ma'am, we do, we okay. do. We, we, have, we have two officers that we have sent to training and uh, dedicated training to patrol 64. And the reason we sent them to de dedicated training is because it is so dangerous stopping a vehicle on 64. So we sent them to uh, Franklin County and other agencies 
to learn how to position the patrol car in a safe manner, learn how to, to approach the car in a safe manner. So we have two or three officers that we have trained or had trained to be able to do that. But every officer does not patrol 64, if that's, if that's what you're The asking. reason I ask that question, I've had several citizens to ask me that question, and I thought, I didn't know that we went outside. Y yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, we do. We do. Is, is there, a, like, a reason that the highway patrol is not taking that portion of 64? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not fair to Highway Patrol for us to issue citations and them answer recs. You so know, they if, can't if, issue citations? No, they can. They can. Yeah. They can issue citations anywhere in the state. Okay. But if we're going to patrol it and, 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 and issue citations or, or, or work traffic, then we also need to be responsible for the recs. You know, it's not fair to them because they're, they're limited too, um, so, you know, as far as their manpower. So it's not fair to them to have to answer crash calls on 64 if we're already enforcing traffic on 64. I'd like to move that we um, accept this resolution. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Your name? Larry Taylor, second. <laughs> All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Kate Burns, aye. We said no. Lynn Hobbs, aye. Larry Taylor, aye. So proceed. And thank you so very much. And uh, Chief Puckett, how are we with officers now? Do we replace the ones? Yes, ma'am. We've got two that we made conditional offers to. As a matter of fact, we're waiting on training and standards for, for one. We've got the paperwork ready on training the standards for another, and then we've got another officer that we're working on her background. Good. So, good, thank good. you. Good. Thank you so much. Great job. The next item on our agenda is, uh, let's see, is 8A, which is American Rescue Plan Funds. Good evening. So, I just am pleased to announce that the town has finally received its first allocation of these funds. They are much anticipated. Um, we received uh, about 800 and over $800,000. I think we were originally expecting it to be closer to 700000 So, we are getting more than we originally anticipated. However, we need a resolution um, per the terms of this grant to receive these funds. And Do we so, have an exact figure? Of how much we received? Uh, one million seven hundred seventy thousand forty-five dollars is how much I'm, we're. Set I'm talking from. about the first payment. Half of that. Exactly half. Yes, exactly. Okay. So well, that's great. Yes. That is real good. So do I hear uh, a motion <clears throat> for the approval of this resolution number twenty twenty-one dash twenty? Mayor Taylor, so made. Second. Louise Hinton. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Kate right. Burns, aye. Lynn Hobbs, aye. Mary Taylor, aye. I have a question. When can we expect to accept the second half? Toward the end of the calendar year. Okay, so probably a full year. 12 months from now. I thought it said it wouldn't come any sooner than 12, than 12 months, months from, 12 from the first disbursement. They've changed it several times. Okay. Yeah, so. oh, okay. <laughs> the last I heard it was toward, closer toward the end of the calendar year. Okay. And this calendar year? Yes, but I could be wrong. I can oh. check yeah. on that. And it said a full year. Yeah, it said from the first you disbursement, the first. you would get the second one a year later. And, no, and no it might not be later. the same amount. Right, but it also made it sound like it might be more. It, that's right. right. It's right. Really. I like that. <laughs> I do too. They said if some municipalities will return right. some funds, right. which won't be natural. No. <laughs> Our next item on our agenda is 8B, and this is the asphalt overlay project. Randy? So staff put out a uh, request for bids for an asphalt overlay of Tate's Lane, uh, McCoy Drive, and the, the south portion of Frick Street. And we got uh, three proposals back from the five companies that we sent that to. And the um, parent low bid on that is a company from here in Nash County. It's uh, Williams Paving. And their bid for that project, and real quick, is $92,365. So I, I have reviewed this bid. I've called the references. Uh, they, they check out. They are um, a PO contractor for the North Carolina Department of Transportation. They do a lot of work for the DOT on paving and asphalt repairs. They haven't done much municipal work yet. Um, they are not a licensed 
contractor in the state of North Carolina at this time. I reviewed that with the town attorney, Mark Edwards, and Mark is of the opinion that if they pursue that, which takes about a month and a half to get, uh, that we are good with awarding this project to them. Uh, I've gotten in writing from them today that they are pursuing that highway contractor's license with the state of North Carolina, and uh, once they do, then they will commence the project. This project is supposed to be done by the end of October, and it is, uh, it is a quantity based. We were on the, on, on the repairs that have to be made to these streets before you can overlay it. Uh, Lee went out, measured them up. We, we feel we have a, a, a responsible quantity in there, but we will actually be paying based upon their unit prices. So if they don't end up doing as much as repair as we have, you know, we, we have 207 square feet um, and their bid is for $38.50. Uh, we wouldn't realize the 10,395 would be something less. Now, conversely, the other way, if they end up having to take more out because it's not suitable when they get there, then there'll be uh, additional price for that. But um, as, as you recall, our surface our street surface program for this fiscal year is kind of a three-part thing asphalt overlay for the three worst streets uh, then we were looking at um, a chip seal you know emulsion with a chip seal for those that are a little a little better and those that don't need much at all just a simple slurry seal and we budgeted 350,000 for that uh, this would be the first 92,000 if the council awards this contract to Williams Paving Inc. from from Bailey, which is what staff is recommending. And this 350 is a loan, is that correct? Sam. Yes. And who is a lending agency? We haven't. We haven't bid for that or anything yet. So we don't have an interest rate. No. Okay, we're servicing this loan with our power bill money. And this contract is going to do all, all three phases of this, right? No, it's only going to do Cates Lane, McCoy Drive, and the south 1,500 feet of Brake Street. This company doesn't do um, chip seal. Those will be other companies that we solicit for chip sealing. They, they do asphalt work. Okay, so that leaves about 258000 for the rest. Is that going to cover it? We'll, we'll have to see, Louise. I, I don't know. I, I was thinking this would be about 88,000 and it came back at 92. Um, you know, those were based upon some unit prices that I got from a, a contractor in this area on what that unit prices were, were being paid at that time. But, you know, by the time this went out and these came back, it was almost a month. And as Kevin had pointed out earlier, you know, the prices on this stuff, they, they just change, change weekly almost. So. Well, we'll have to see. If, if the rest of uh, the scope of work comes in more than that, the, the decision will be we have to drop a few streets off to stay within, or if we get a good price and you want it to proceed, maybe the council authorized borrowing a little more money and we do the full scope as, as we had planned. Those would be the options. Have we beat it the second section out yet? No, not yet, no. Not yet. Now those three streets, are those the only ones that are too far gone or are those the only ones too far gone that we're doing this year? Those are the ones where we're, we're basically three years behind on our program. Okay. So looking at what was supposed to be done for FY19, FY20, and 21, uh, the program that we put forth and talked about it encompasses all those streets. And there's like, I don't know, there's probably close to 30, 35 streets in there. So we'll see what the price costs come back and hopefully we'll be able to do them all. And is the contract, um, or I guess this is a resolution that we'd be doing, um, but is it null and void if they don't obtain their licensing? It is. Okay. And then just a comment, I think we got the wrong resolution in our package. Do you all have the right one in yours? Exactly, it's wrong. <laughs> uh, it's supposed to be for the, the asphalt project, but it, it says it's for the American Rescue Plan <laughs> Act yeah, funds. Yeah. Well, no wonder I couldn't find it. <laughs> Not in here. <laughs> I meant to call you about that ring. The, the other two bids, uh, well, you know, we, we got from Marshall, 
Marshall uh, Contracting, they're from Nashville, closer to Spring Hope. Theirs was 104, and the other one was Barnhill Contracting from Rocky Mount at uh, 149,000. <laughs> Those were the other two bids. When, when will we know about interest rates as far as uh, 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 the lending entity that we're going to? It could be a while. I've got to go through the LGC to get their approval for this first. So this is an LGC approval required. So, so it hasn't been approved by the LGC? No, that takes months. And then that can take months. Okay. But because it's LGC debt, usually the rates are much lower. Okay. So we'll jump on that immediately. Okay, so are we doing something that LGC hasn't approved yet? I no, mean, you can do the project. You can't issue the debt for it until you get LGC approval. So should this be subject to LGC approval or are we moving forward? Getting ahead of ourselves. Regardless. Yeah, that's my because if we don't get it approved, then it all falls on us, right? Well, we, we do have $92,000 worth of power funds on hand already. Okay. Okay. So then we could use the LGC for and the remainder. The second, okay. second part of our, our street surfacing program. Okay. Uh, uh -huh. Any questions? Other questions, Council? If not, do I hear a, a motion that we approve this resolution 20 21 awarding the asphalt overlay pending that they get their license? And um, so. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Can I have a table second? Oh, yeah, Kate Burns for the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Lee Hobbs, aye. So um, move forward with that then. Thank you. Motion carries. Our next uh, item on our agenda is uh, the major, major subdivision plat review and approve a major subdivision plat of. RBD Investments Incorporated for lots 8 through 19 of the Birchwood uh, subdivision. Sherry. Good afternoon again. So this is a request from RBD Investments. He submitted construction, well, construction flat and a final flat CP 2021-01 and FP 2021-01 has been submitted for approval of a 12 lot major subdivision off Birchwood Drive. Zoning district R10, which is medium density residential. The proposed lots are 12,800 square feet in size and already abut a public street, water main, and a sewer main. They also already have access to natural gas, electricity, and telecommunication, telecommun uh, I'm sorry, telecommunication lines. This parcel contains approximately 3.528 plus or minus acres and is identified by Nash County tax parcel number 3810-09-06-8689. There are no proposed improvements for the site as they are all already in place. So uh, surrounding the properties, adjacent property to the right is owned by RBD Investments LLC and across the street is Birchwood Home Subdivision. Also, the town staff's technical review committee met to review the final plat and construction plat. The planning board met July 7, 2021 to review the final plat and construction plat. There was no discussion, there, were, there was discussion about requiring sidewalks, but it was noted that Birchwood Drive is not a curbed and gutted street and, construct, and constructing a public sidewalk in the street right of way would place the sidewalk in the street's ditch. The planning board approved the final plat and construction plat without a sidewalk and is recommending the same to the town council. Staff and planning board recommends approval of the construction plat CP 2021-01 and final plat FP 2021-01 and in addition to this approval, I would like to give a few conditions that due to the size of the due to the size of the subdivision, planning staff is recommending to waive requirements 18-366 E and H and 18-400. 
in regards to utilities since they are already in place. So what, what that 18366E is, is a review of other officials, uh, the school superintendent, the soil and water conservation. Uh, it has been reviewed by the district DOT, uh, Bobby Lieberman and the fire chief as required because it was only 12 lots, uh, staff didn't see the need uh, to have the superintendent or the schools uh, take a look-see at it, and, and the same with soils and water. That uh, 18366H, uh, that is a requirement that when you parcel off twice, the third one, you have to have a full plan for the balance of the land. The town has already, the council has already seen that uh, at previous meetings, and uh, in negotiation, so to speak, with the developer on the balance of it. So we're, we're recommending that that requirement be waived at, at this time. And then the, the final one is uh, the uh, 18400E, um, which is, I'm drawing a blank on that one. Can you recall, Terry? This was regarding um, the water and sewer utilities. Oh, and we wait, yeah, we waived that because there are no future improvements and utilities already in place. Now that requirement is that NCDOT has to give permitting for water and sewer extensions. There aren't any with this, so recommending waiver of that requirement. Any questions from the council? Based on that, I move that we approve. Your name? Larry Taylor. <laughs> I just wanted to place um, two additional conditions on this, and that's just. Um, approved with the condition that the applicant complies with 18-401, um, which has to do with telephone and internet, and also complies with 18-404, which has to do with preservation of existing trees that are 12 inches or larger in diameter. Is so there? There are no trees in this section. Well, there are. There, there are but, uh, lots. Where? 12, 13. Ten, eleven, twelve. There are six trees on those lots. If there's a hardship, if they can't save those trees because of where the house is planned to be or the driveway or whatever, they just have to go to Sherry or to um, Randy and have them basically say, yes, this is a hardship. We can um, have you just replant trees in, in a better location after the fact, or no, this isn't an extreme hardship. You can just move over a foot and everything will work out. And it all depends on which house plan they lay out on right. the lot. You won't know until then. But it's just part of our, our code that needs to be complied with. So right now, we don't know if the trees will need to be removed. It's we don't. Okay. Correct. Larry made a motion that we approve. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor, <laughs> let it be known by saying aye. 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 Oh, Kate Burns, aye. Lynn? With those conditions. Lynn Hobbs, aye. Okay. Our next item is um, the audit contract, um, Samantha. So in your packet, you've got the annual contract for the independent audit services, and you just require, statute requires that be approved by council on an annual basis. And so I recommend that we go with the same auditor as we used last year. Is this the same fee? Yes, ma'am. Were they going to charge us an additional 5000 for some kind of retirement when the LGC came in and looked at our retirement? Yes, so we have been randomly selected by the state for uh, an, a an audit of our treatment of the orbit retirement, and so they are going to be conducting that for us at an additional cost of five thousand. But that's, that's separate from upcoming. This. It is for a year prior. Okay, it's for a year previous. There will also be some additional fees related to the ARA funds. Um, that's separate from this contract. Um, we don't know how much that's going to cost. I assume it's going to be closer to about five thousand as well. We can use ARA funds to pay for that. Goodness gracious. Mm, they are. <laughs> okay, do I um, hear um, a motion from the council of approval of FY 2021 independent audit contract with Petway, Mills, and Pearson? So moved. Kate Burns. Second, Larry Taylor. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Lynn Hobbs, aye. Thank you. 
Motion carries, so we'll proceed with the same auditors that we had last year. Our next item is uh, the library IT contract. Uh, Tequila Austin, are you here? I thought I saw she you. Came uh, in. I saw She's you. Okay. Yeah, okay. You want to come talk to us about that? <laughs> so, for those that don't know me, I'm Tequila Austin, the library director. In regards to the library IT services, the library cannot operate without IT services. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, efficiently, because we can operate, we're operating right now because we're in a new fiscal year. But when I mean efficiently, like if something happened to our server or if something happened to our computers at this moment, I do know some IT, some IT things, but we need someone that is experienced in that field. So, um, I just wanted to update you and let you know that Braswell Memorial Library is who we had a contract with. That contract has now expired. They have decided that they will not renew that contract. And um, this was um, told to us like a couple of days within the time of the contract ending. It ended on June 30th, and this is the new fiscal year, which is July 1st, has passed. And so right now we do not have anybody. Tequila, can I interrupt? I'm sorry. Did they give you any reason for ending yeah. the contract? We've been with them for years. Oh, so I'm going to tell you what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a story behind it, unfortunately. So they had a professional there. His name is Mark. I don't know if you're familiar with Mark. Um, I'm trying to think of Mark's last name. Samuel. That's it. So, so anyway, so he was the only professional with them that was full time. And then a, maybe like, a, I'll say a couple of months, three or four months before he actually left them in June, he, they end up getting a, a part time worker to assist him. And she is there now, but he left, so, but she's not able to do the same services that he provided. And now they are seeking IT services themselves. So is this a partnership that could be Reestablish exactly next year. Well, I, or once I they actually find somebody. tried to work something out with Brassel, but she um, encouraged us to seek otherwise, and that she's looking for someone herself. She said it was um, she had to actually focus on Brassel, trying to meet the needs from Brassel. Um, um, actually, we was in the same meeting, and so um, Randy knows as well because it was a three person meeting myself, the library director from Braswell, and Randy. Randy um, can verify that she was not interested in, okay. in she's renewing. She's looking to sever ties. She was. Uh, okay. But we, we tried to. We really did try to see what we could do with her, like whatever she was going to get. Could we partner with that? and Or could she work with us um, like a couple of, you know, for a little while anyway, but. She just said that she was she was actually thinking about doing something remotely, possibly. I remember that at, at a distance. And so we're trying to go in a different direction because we're a small library. And we we have had a success with Mark. And he he will come to the library when we are in need. And right now we don't have that service. And so it's imperative that we find some type of solution for this. I wanted to say that VC3 was an option, but the cost was um, fairly high. And um, we're looking at over 2000 it was $2,942 a month, which was been $35,000 and $304 annually. Now, Mark is proposing like $1,037 per month, which would be or $12,396 annually. I, If you want my personal and professional opinion. I would say that Mark, um, I don't know him like on a personal level, but he knows the system. He implemented all the software. He understands the library piece of the library software. And if someone else come in, they would have to learn and understand everything that where we're at. There's codes, there's softwares, a lot of stuff out there that only Mark really understood. Like I, like right now, I don't have certain things. Now is Mark the one that he's the one that left Rocky Mountain? Right. Yes. Is he now like consulting and just doing 
right. several different libraries. That's his own business. That's his own business. Will this interfere with our relationship with Brazel and our okay. library line and so forth? So, so from my understanding, by Mark being his own entity, <laughs> it should not. Um, we did not speak with Mark in regards to this until he completely went his separate way. So it wasn't like he came to me and said, Tequila, I'm interested in um, joining your team or I'm interested in developing a contract with you because I'm leaving Brassville. It didn't work that way. Um, when, sh when the contract ended, this is when we kind of discussed what we should do. Has anyone reached out to other local libraries, Wilson, Elm City, Spring Hope, or even Nash Community College Library to see who they use for IT? Or? Yes. Um, so I contacted Nash Community College. I haven't had a response back from them yet. Um, I called, uh, contacted Wilson Community College. I have not had a um, response from them yet. And um, Halifax, Com Com Halifax, excuse me, Halifax County Public Library, they explained to me, I spoke to the director there, her name is Brenda Faithful. She explained to me that they are um, they, even though they have like different branches and they're of one system, that they receive services from the county in itself. So just like we well, municipal and then you have county libraries, the, the county pays a specific person or, or entity for to provide services for each one of their departments. So, so they're not interested in partnering and they're just trying to um, support their own county. So Braswell, of course, we discussed Braswell. Um, I did find out about um, a business in Wilson called Computer Central. They, I spoke to a, a representative there. She told me I need to talk to Tina Mooring. I left Tina Mooring a message. She did not contact me back, but she did. But the representative on the phone did say that they are familiar with a lot of different type of services with. Um, computers, but I need to make sure they understand the library system. Then I talked to someone in on Sunset Computer Techs, that's a company in Rocky Mount. They told me they can do computer um, um, management, but they're not able to do it for a library. I talked to uh, Tremaine McQueen at Nash Rocky Mount Schools. He told me he would give me three resources, but I have not yet heard anything from him. So it's not like I haven't been seeking um, IT management. It's not. It's just not the easy. Does Nash County have anybody that can do that? I am trying to get a, a hold of Nash. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get a hold of Nash County, and I was trying to see if they had a service provider which we can in turn use. Mm -hmm. But I have not been able to be successful mm -hmm. right now. All the options I had was VC3 and Mark for right this moment, and we're willing to maybe if you're interested. Um, maybe uh, see because we are in need like now so maybe we can give him like uh, a year uh, a contract at least would he do anything less than a year I'm just thinking if, if Nash Community College gets back to you or Wilson gets back to you or Rocky Mount Schools get back to you or Nash County gets back to you first how long have you been waiting for a response and secondly if we could do something just shorter term with Mark you know for a month or two to actually receive responses from or some of these. Or just pay him if we had a problem. Okay, so we can consider that. I never Don't thought about that part about just paying a contract. Right. Okay. And that we could keep looking. Okay. And I know you mentioned Tremaine with the Nash County Schools, mm -hmm. but I don't know. He will probably give you some resources, but I know that they are all we didn't have enough when I was there, so. Right, that's exactly what he was trying to um, find, the IT um, management services providers that they're working with to be able to relay and give to us. Uh, um, like I said, I have been waiting for a while for some of these. Um, I Everybody is busy and everybody, it, it's, it's not just one person you call, they have to find out who it is that they have and then I have to get in touch with who they have. So it's kind of like you're going through different people to, re uh -huh, to reach to who you need to speak to. So it's not like I could just pick up the phone and talk to their IT people directly. Cause some of them probably have like a distance IT mm -hmm. person. This is like what Brass was talking about when she said somewhere, what was it, was it Virginia somewhere? It's like a distance and it's a remote, but we don't need anything remotely. Okay. Well, let, let me suggest don't, don't call the county, just walk across the street. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, okay. Do I, um, what is your um, desires council that we do? 
I had just one last question. Um, the monthly IT fee in here said that was based on $40 per hour at um, five hours per week. Is that what was previously happening where they would, you would need assistance five hours a week from IT? Well, I know to be honest with you, the whole um, agreement is totally different because uh, Braswell already had a longer period contract and it was just one set fee for the whole year. This is based on like if we, he were to provide at least five hours per week because he was anticipating that if he come and he had the help with maybe the server or the computers itself, <laughs> they may take at least up to five hours, maybe not five hours, but at least up to like, if he work on one thing, it may take one or two hours to work on, he work on something else, it takes two hours. So he was adding it up as if he was to be there for five hours. Right, I'm just thinking if we could just take that $40 per hour like you were suggesting and just on an as needed basis. Until we until get we, some more information. Right decide to fully enter into a contract with them for him for a year or go with another outfit i think what they mean by that is so he would be available to us remotely pretty much all the time right. but if he needed to come on site that would be a cost of forty dollars per hour I w it's kind of unclear here because it says the fee is based on the rate of forty dollars per hour and five hours per week and includes the cost of remote support I think he's um, but then it says when he has to be on site that he's going to be submitting additional invoices for his travel expenses. Yeah, yeah, because he did say to me that it, he has a contract also with, I hope I can say this, Edgecombe County. I am aware of that, right? So he did say to me that if he was in the area, which he most likely would be because he has another contract, um, that he would not, he would just charge us from where he's at. So he lives kind of far from us, but he wasn't anticipating to, like, every time he charges, us, he would charge us from where he's located. It would be in the area because he's near, like, he was in, in, in near the area, he wouldn't mm -hmm. do that fee. See if you're entertaining a month to month contract for right now. So what is it? That's the, my turn. I, I need a motion. Who's that a motion, Leah? Oh, uh, I would move that she explore to see if he would take a, a month to month contract till we find out how this other stuff works out. We may get somebody cheaper, better, yeah. closer, whatever. See if he'll entertain a month to month contract first. Okay. I uh, will do. I will just say that I have been looking at the prices for IT. Sam and I both agreed that IT services is fairly um, expensive, but I'll work on it. Okay. But it is fairly expensive, unfortunately. So do I hear a second to Larry's? Louise Hinton seconds. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye that we will uh, contract Mark on a monthly basis until we do our some more research. Kate Burns, aye. Larry Taylor, aye. Lynn Hobbs, aye. Motion carries, and thank you so much for continuing to check on uh, these, and good luck. <laughs> okay, thank you. I do apologize that we don't have any other choices well, at that's, this time. Well, that, well, we'll keep got looking got 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 short way. notice. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda dirt is um, one I hate to say, mm. increasing tipping fees by the city of Rocky Mount and consideration of increasing the town's monthly solid waste fee. Samantha? So first week of July, the town received this letter from the city of Rocky Mount. Um, the letter was dated June 29th. Um, it informed us um, that they are gonna have to increase their fees. They're increasing their transfer station tipping fees by $2.25 per ton, in addition to a $2 per ton excise tax, okay? So the tipping fees um, are the town's disposal costs for the garbage, the trash, and the yard waste. So this is a 7% increase over the current fees. Um, and an increase, um, the increase is projected to cost the town an additional $13,000 in solid waste disposal fees. To cover the increased cost, a 50 cent increase is needed in the town's monthly sanitation fee to the customers from $20.50 to $21. There again, we don't have a, a choice. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we all have the trash picked up. I move that we accept this new figure, the 50 cent increase. Kate Burns, second. Larry. Uh, reluctantly, I second. Um, all those in favor, let it be uh, Lynn. Lynn, let it be known yes. by saying aye. Okay. Aye. Aye. She said yes. Yeah. Lynn, I'll right. yes. Okay, thank you so much. So we will have to, we don't have a choice. So let's move on to our last item on our agenda. And um, really, this is, we've discussed this prior to this, and we will, we will vote on this on, um, did we agree to vote on this on August the 3rd? So this has been taken care of. I thought so. Hallelujah. So anyway, uh, do the council have any, do any of the council have comments? Mayor, I'd, I'd like to ask the question. Was there any notification to the police department or to fire department or either the town hall that somebody was going to have a fireworks display this past weekend? No, sir. It was I'm surprised I didn't hear it. I'm just down the block. I don't see why you didn't. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I I started to get out really? and ride around and find out what it was, but I thought it was—I thought it was coming from over at the Brickwood area. But yeah, there was probably a second show happening there. <laughs> but it was—it was—it was a whole bunch of stuff going on. And another thing, too, uh, a different issue: the water—the water bills. When I saw this last item that we just looked over about the tipping fee going up fifty cents, I went, "Oh God, not again!" But that's something that we that, that we cannot do. But to the citizens out there, believe it, this council thought long and hard before we put this this new rate into effect. And what we were telling everybody, we were under the impression that your bill would go up $15, $16. That's what we all, all thought. Now, I'm hearing from people saying that their bill went from $60 to $300. That's, 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 that's unreal for anybody to take a grasp of. And I think one, one resident told me that he went from using 2,000 gallons to 10,000 gallons. Well, if we got customers, residents here in town, that their, their water usage went from 2,000 gallons to 10,000 gallons, they don't have any leaks. Well, if you're using 10,000 gallons of water, you got a leak somewhere, and you would be able to see it. But if they already had a plumber to come around and check for leaks and don't have leaks, and nobody in the house, we don't have more people staying in the house, we need to take those bills and back off and, and have our guys go out and check it, make sure the meters are reading like they should. But if we went from 2,000 to 10,000, uh, that's hard for even me to swallow. They, I, I think we need to go back and look at their last 12 months of bills and, and give them a prorated uh, a bill based on what their past uses would be. I think that's only fair to do that. But that, that's, that's, that's my feeling. Now, if, you keep, if, you, if we do that, and you come out next month and you still got the same um, same interest, now the residents have to do your, your part too. You've got to make sure that you've checked all your uh, faucets in the house, you've checked your commodes in the house, you've looked under the you house and checked. Watering yeah, and watering flowers. Yeah, and you're not watering flowers. You, it got me one time what I did. I had my house power washed, and I didn't think about it. So that's why mine went up that month. But if you're doing the same thing that you have been doing for the last 12 months, and your bill goes from 2,000 gallons to 10,000 gallons, then we need to take a harder look at it. Uh, and I think it's only fair to, to prorate it. We do, and we have a process in place for that. We do have Are a process. Are you aware yes. of, of the ones that spoke tonight about their bills? I've and, not and been issues? made aware of those specifically, okay. um, but um, what it sounds like is that my employees are, are doing, following the protocol and are having those investigated. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure why they weren't followed up on um, in the time that they were expecting. I can look into that. Um, but what it sounds like, um, especially the the lady who spoke mm -hmm. second she had a leak is what it sounds like she we sent when we notice that mm -hmm. somebody has abnormally high usage we send them a letter um, notifying them that they may have a problem and that they might want to check on that okay. uh, if we if we see an abnormally high bill like that we can send a check out to see and make sure that there's no issue on our side um, but if there's no issue on our side and in fact even these new meters can tell when water is passing through those meters so we can actually see that data then it's uh, the responsibility of that customer that resident to identify on their end that they don't have a leak right and if they do find a leak and they have that repaired um, they can send that information to us and we'll provide that adjustment to them. Okay. 
Um, we need Mr. To make sure excuse me, Mr. Baker did receive, uh, he's still here, did receive here. a letter from the town indicating that he had a higher bill. Okay, he uh, got a plumber to come out and check his house and his, no leaks. And he came to town hall to address it. Mm -hmm. And, but there's been no feedback. He had, su supposedly someone was to go out to his house and double check and well, I'm not aware of um, your situation specifically, sir, but I can definitely check on that tomorrow. Yes, I've, I've got an, already got a note to check on that, um, but usually we would send a tech out just to make sure there's no issue on our end, and then we can actually, it depends on what kind of meter register you have, but a lot of them we can actually see the specific time frame when that water passed through. That can give you an indication of maybe trip you know spark your memory of maybe you were doing something that at that time that caused that usage right. yeah th those do happen um, they're happening less and less now because we've replaced so many of the old ones um, but each and every time we do uh, take those into consideration and and adjust why, appropriately. And why I'm talking to you is because like I spoke to Mr. Lanson, you know, because and it, and it may be maybe this amount of get outside the yard. And being honest, I don't know. I can see ten thousand gallons, but that's why I was asking you said that for since if you how about I cannot put a well in because that water would not be going into the sewer system. It'd be strictly for agriculture. That's and I just want to know is there a problem with if I decide to put a well in? It's, it's not allowed. Our ordinance prohibits private wells within the town of Nashville. Why is that, Mr. Manson? Because the water is not going into the young thing. All, all I can say, James, is it's in the book. So <laughs> the previous council made that decision. Oh, you can put wheels in here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, any other comments, council? Um, I just wanted to first verify, and if it's accurate, um, just announce it, that the comprehensive plan drop by workshop is here tomorrow yes. july 14th between three and seven um so everybody come out and voice your opinions and views and desires so that uh, the comprehensive plan is comprehensive and this is especially important because this comprehensive plan was done during the pandemic and so participation has been very meager and so we're spending seventy five thousand dollars on this comprehensive plan <laughs> with very little input from the public so this is our last chance so you know and w one other thing i'd like to say in reference to all these consultants that we've had over the years that have recommended this that and the other and that we've paid for or got grants for i would say this a consultant is someone who's at least 500 miles from home a lot of their suggestions have uh, encompassed a great deal of money money that maybe the town did not have to invest. And I've always said it takes somebody with really deep pockets to come in and make change. So I would say that, you know, in reference to all these consultants' ideas, maybe we didn't do it because there was no money to do it. Well, I, I just wanted to express the desire of the citizens as well is yeah. in those. Um, regarding the comprehensive plan, we had stated when we redid the water bills and they started going out, in envelopes that we would try to get the survey out so we could get additional feedback. Is that something that we can still do? We could do, I mean, we could send a letter out. Um, we couldn't put it with the bills at this time, um, but we could send a letter out. To, or, a separate letter. Okay, to get the survey out so that folks that are at home and don't feel comfortable coming to a workshop in person but actually, the lady had said at our last meeting that we had had very good input, as okay. good as she'd seen in any town. Okay. She really did. I, I forgot who the other council person was there. Lynn. Lynn. I did, was there. Didn't she say that, Lynn? Yes, she did. She said we had had very good input, and she was real proud of the number of citizens that had come out to give input. So I felt very good about that. But we certainly do want all of you to come out tomorrow come in there's no scheduled time is floating and just give your input because i'm telling you we're in these positions not to hurt a soul but to help nashville 
be the best it can be. And I believe if we as a council will work together and face this vision and think about all the citizens and not just ourselves, we will be successful. But it's going to take your input too. It's not all about us. Our heart's here to serve you, believe it or not. But thank you for coming out. Are there any other comments? Yeah, no, oh, that one. Yes. I've got just a simple question. Why would you go, why would you go to Zeppelin for an audit? And you sit the for an audit of the books and everything at the town council. You, I mean, why would you go to Zeppelin as opposed to some firm here? Because that, there's certain auditors that audit towns. And we right. did put out bids. And we put out bids. So okay, it's based on who responds. There was a bid. It was advertised in the paper. It was on the website. We reached out okay. and we received we received right many. Well, um, they were the best. You know, as to right. Here, I understand your question. Okay. Thank you for asking it. And the statute doesn't permit us to give any sort of preference locally. Although we would like to, by statute, <laughs> we're not allowed to. Be no further business, I move we adjourn. Do I hear a second? Second. What are you saying? All those in favor of adjournment, let it be known by saying aye. Kate Burns, aye. You can uh, Mary aye. Taylor, aye. Lynn? She did. Okay, good. Have a good evening, and we hope to see you here tomorrow.